Hello and welcome to your weekend edition of LMU Community TV News. I'm Ashley Hurley. Thank you for joining us. The Kentucky State Police have confirmed that Bell County Detention Center escaped inmate Jason Carbone was captured in Knox County, Kentucky earlier this week. It was reported that Carbone allegedly stole a Bell County school bus and traveled to the Flat Lick area. A tip then led to his arrest. Kentucky State Police Post 10 in Harlan said that they were contacted by the Bell County Detention Center on Monday evening stating that Carbone had walked away from the ball court area of the jail. Trooper Jay Souders responded to the detention center and determined that Carbone had escaped the facility. He was being sought for second degree escape. Carbone was arrested last Friday on burglary charges, but no word yet on his extradition to Tennessee or North Carolina. A police, a police pursuit landed a male and female behind bars Tuesday afternoon. The male and female led officers on a pursuit from a home in Tazewell down Speedwell and into the Flatwoods community. Police then created a perimeter surrounding the area and located the vehicle, but the two were not inside. They were later spotted walking down the road and were then taken into custody and transported to the Claiborne County Jail. Gary Oliver is charged with felony evading arrest, destruction of county property, two counts of aggravated assault, assault on police officers, impeding traffic, and reckless driving. The name of the female is not being released as the incident remains under investigation. Oliver's mugshot was not readily available when I contacted the Claiborne County Sheriff's Office, but tune in on Monday as we continue to follow this story. A Tennessee man faces felony charges in Kentucky for what police say he posted on Facebook. According to reports, 36-year-old David Lunsford threatened Binghamtown Baptist Church and Gateway Christian School in Middlesboro. On your screen is a photo of Lunsford that was taken from his Facebook page courtesy of the Bell County Sheriff's Department. In one post, Lunsford said that he would like to crash a plane into the school. David Lunsford was arrested in Tennessee last Friday and charged with terroristic threatening and harassing communications. Lunsford is being held at the Bell County Detention Center on a $25,000 cash bond. Lunsford was arraigned earlier this week and he pled not guilty. His preliminary hearing is set for October 13th. Monday afternoon, the International Potluck Dinner was held in observance of the International Day of Peace, Rosh Hashanah, EID, and National Hispanic Awareness Month. LMU students, staff and faculty, and community, community members all came together to share a meal that represented various ethnic or regional backgrounds. Countries that were represented at the dinner were Nigeria, Tun, Tun, I'm sorry, Egypt, France, Germany, Ireland, England, India, Iraq, Kenya, Republic of Congo, Japan, and the United States. Earlier this week, the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum hosted celebrated Abraham Lincoln biographer Dr. Ronald C. White Jr. It was the latest installment of the Kincaid Lecture Series. White delivered remarks titled Lincoln's Sermon on the Mount based on the book Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the Second Inaugural. The lecture was held inside the Arnold Auditorium of the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum right here on the main campus of Lincoln Memorial University. White has lectured at the White House and he has also been interviewed on PBS News Hour. He is a graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary. He has studied at the Lincoln Theological College in England and he lives in California with his wife. Now for more information on future series presenters, you can contact Program and Tourism Director Carol Campbell at 423-869-6439. Well, Tuesday morning, high school juniors and seniors from across the area made their way to the Tex Turner Arena for the Tri-State College Fair. Six high schools from Kentucky, eight schools from Tennessee, and a small group from Lee County, Virginia participated in the College Fair. Colleges and universities that included Lincoln Memorial University, the University of Tennessee, East Tennessee State University, Tusculum, and many others 
were on hand to hand out information on their programs and to introduce students to other programs that their schools offer. The college fair kicked off at 8.30 and ran through lunch. Now we will bring you more information on the next Tri-State College Fair if you want to bring your high school student and introduce them to the colleges and opportunities for their future. Well, today we are continuing our conversation with Dr. Throckmorton, one of the professors who was featured in one of the two papers published in the journal eLife describing one of the latest scientific discoveries. The discovery of a new species of human relative in a cave outside of Johannesburg, South Africa was announced two weeks ago at the University of Witwatersrand by the National Geographic Society and the South African National Research Foundation. Now to tell us more, here is Dr. Throckmorton to explain his involvement in the project. The word science uh, is actually derived from the Latin word uh, which means to cut. And what we do is we cut away things that we know are not real or not facts or not true. And what we are left with then is some idea of what is real and what are facts. And we try to put them together into ways that are useful to think about uh, and those are the development of theories and hypotheses. We have had enough pieces of the puzzle about human evolution for a long enough time that we have a very good idea of what the basics are. Right. I mean, there are certain things that at this point are very, very clear, and Homo naledi changes none of them. Um, we know that our earliest ancestors uh, first initially evolved in Africa. That's still the case. We know that they were walking on two legs like we do rather than on four limbs like chimpanzees. That's still true. Um, you know, when one of the things that is so interesting about Homo naledi is that its feet and ankles are really, really human-like. Um, so one of the things that it might change is we uh, are not entirely clear at, at necessarily uh, whether certain parts of our anatomy became more like they are today sooner or later. Uh, the earliest evolutionary researchers placed an enormous amount of emphasis on, you know, humans evolved to have a big brain first because that's what makes us special today. We got big brains, we do smart stuff. We also do really stupid stuff, but that's, you know, we have the capacity to do very smart stuff. Um, but as we've continued to study human evolution and we've continued to make better observations of other animals, we know that that's not true. The earliest human ancestors do not have large brains. They did not make particularly impressive stone tools. I mean, I can show anyone how to make an early stone tool in 15 minutes. I mean, this is not, this is not technically sophisticated stuff. Um, and we, uh, so now we've, you know, we've cut away what we know is not true by finding more information. And I think this is interesting that we've found in Homo naledi a uh, human-like uh, relative that is got our has feet that are very much like ours and has hands that in many ways are like ours and has legs that are in many ways like ours but its shoulder joints are very different than ours uh, and its brain is very small it's less than half the size of a typical human's brain today um, and yet they were apparently uh, all the available evidence suggests that they were able to navigate through the length of a football field in through this cave and they were deliberately disposing their conspecifics in the chamber. And, you know, we have a tendency to think of humans who are alive today as the normal and everything else as the other. And so we look at them through our eyes. And I think what's really interesting about Homo naledi is if you can, if you have a, you know, where they were has never been visible with light coming in from the outside world. If you can, we have reason to believe that they would have been able to control fire and you are deliberately going through this uh, process that is pretty torch, you know, dragging them through the cave to deliberately dispose of them. Why are our brains so big? Because you can do, you can apparently do some pretty complicated and pretty sophisticated things. You can have some very impressive behaviors. This is what Homo naledi did is beyond the reach of anything that is alive today, except of course for us. Um, why did we continue to evolve such huge brains? 
And we will finish our discussion with Dr. Throckmorton on next week's LMU Community TV News. The announcement that we have been talking about the past few weeks will also be featured on the cover of the October issue of National Geographic. Now let's turn to Adam Haley who is going to bring us sports for this upcoming weekend. Welcome back. Last Tuesday, the LMU volleyball team made the short trip to Jefferson City, Tennessee to face South Atlantic Conference leader Carson Newman. The Eagles came out like the team they're supposed to be at the top of the conference as they hit 400 for the match and took set one 25 to 15. LMU would battle back and prove to not be an easy, as an easy opponent on this night as the Lady Rail Splitters took set two 26 24. Carson Newman came back and took set three 25 19 when the Lady Rail Splitters hit only .080. The seesaw battle went back to LMU in set four, 25-19, but too many errors and a negative hitting percentage in the fifth and deciding set doomed LMU as they would fall in set three, 15-9. Brooke Fleeman led LMU with 18 kills, while Abby Cash racked up another 14 assists on the year in the loss. The ladies will be back at home this weekend when they face Coker College on Friday night at 7 p.m. and Wingate University on Saturday at 2 p.m. LMU Sports Network coverage will have live coverage starting 10 minutes before the scheduled start time for both LMU Community TV and LMURailsplitters.com. The LMU soccer teams also made a short trip on Wednesday, only they went to Greenville, Tennessee to face Tusculum. The LMU men started the double header, and while the two teams put up 10 total shots in the first half, neither team could put one at the back of the net, and we went to half scoreless. LMU's Nathaniel Johnson was ejected late in the first half and would leave LMU a man down in the second. LMU's Philip Wong put LMU on the board in the 72nd minute, only to have Tusculum tied up in the 78th minute to send the game to overtime. Only five total shots between the two teams were put up in overtime one and in two, and LMU and Tusculum would have to settle for the one-to-one -one tie. The LMU women and the Tusculum women had the nightcap, and scoring was on display. LMU's Katie Soul scored first in the 15th minute, and Tusculum's Keisha Anderson connected three minutes later to tie the game at one. Again in the 34th and 36th minutes, the two teams exchanged goals. This time it was Olivia Thompson for the Lady Rail Splitters. LMU's Katie Soul scored again in the 54th minute, and Tusculum's Carly Mill scored in the 64th minute to make the score 3-3. Neither team could score again as they would go to overtime. In OT, each team put up three shots but couldn't score, and in the second overtime, the Pioneers put up three more shots. But as fate would have it, the two would have to settle for a double overtime 3-3 three three tie. Both soccer teams will be on the road this weekend for a double header with Lenore Ryan. Now let's take a look at the upcoming high school football games in the tri-state area. In Kentucky, Middlesbrough will be at home still looking for their first win of the season when they play host to Harlan Independent. The Green Dragons will be looking for their first 5-0 start to a season since the 1999 year. Pineville will be at home after their bye week hosting the Cumberland Gap Panthers. This will be the first meeting ever between the two and the Panthers will be looking to break their 12-game losing streak. In Tennessee, Cleveland will be at home again to host the Granger Grizzlies. Both teams are coming in at 2-2, two and two, and it'll be a homecoming of sorts as former Claiborne head coach Barry Lyles will return to Bulldog Field, however, this time as quarterback's coach at Granger. This is our Old Town Grill Game of the Week, and our pregame coverage will start at 6 p.m. on 91.3 FM WLMU with Spotlight on Tri-State Football. Campbell County will be at home hosting Cock County. This will be the first time since 1998 the Cougars and the Fighting Cocks have faced each other. Hancock County will be on the road at Cosby. The Indians will be looking for their first win over Cosby in school history. Jellico will be at home once again this week when they play host to Lynn Camp, Kentucky. The Blue Devils are still looking for their first home win since 2013. And finally in Virginia, the Thomas Walker Pioneers will be on the road at Eastside to face the Spartans. Thomas Walker will be looking to win back-to-back -back for the first time since 2011, while Eastside is looking for their first win of the season. Now that's all for sports, however, stay tuned. Joseph Lewis and Tyler Rowlett will be here after the break to let you know what movies are being released this weekend and what concerts are happening around the area when we return to LMU Community TV News. <laughs> Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov.
Hello, I'm Joseph Lewis, bringing you all the latest information in the world of movies. Coming to theaters this weekend is The Green Inferno, filmmaker Eli Roth's long-awaited return to the big screen and his first film in the eight years since Hostel Part Two, Centered around a group of student activists visiting the Amazon rainforest who find themselves victimized by a native tribe, the film pays loving homage to Italian exploitation films of the 70s and 80s, most notably Cannibal Holocaust. Another director re-emerging after several years is Nancy Myers, whose new romantic comedy The In turn stars Anne Hathaway as a CEO heading a community outreach program giving the elderly opportunities to intern at her company. Candidate number one is Robert De Niro with whom she generates more chemistry than she ever could have expected. Rene Russo co-stars. Also opening this weekend is Hotel Transylvania 2, Jendi Tartakovsky's sequel to 2012's hit animated comedy featuring the voice talents of Adam Sandler, Andy Samberg, and Kevin James among others. Furthering the antics of Count Dracula, Frankenstein, and other classic monsters, Hotel Transylvania 2 sees most of the original cast returning, this time joined by Nick Offerman, Megan Mullally, and Mel Brooks. Two other films begin expanding from their limited release this weekend, and first up is Pawn Sacrifice, the latest work from Blood Diamond director Edward Zwick, in which Tobey Maguire stars as chess prodigy Bobby Fischer, caught in the center of the U.S.-Soviet conflict in the days leading up to the 1972 World Chess Championship. Leif Schreiber co-stars as his opponent, Boris Spassky, alongside Robin Wright, Peter Sarsgaard and Michael Stuhlbarg. And lastly for this week, also expanding, is Sicario, a crime thriller in the vein of Steven Soderbergh's Traffic, set at the U.S.-Mexico border and focused on the American government's escalating war on drugs. Emily Blunt stars as idealistic FBI operative Kate Maser, alongside Benicio Del Toro, Josh Brolin, and The Walking Dead's John Bernthal. The film is helmed by Prisoners director Denis Veneuve. All five of these films can be seen in theaters nationwide starting this Friday, September 25th, and as always, be sure to check your local listings for special Thursday night screenings in the area. That's all for today in the world of movies. I'm Joseph Lewis. Hi, I'm Tyler Allett for 91.3 WLMU and LMU Community TV. And here's your concert calendar for the week of September 24th, 2015. Coming Friday, September 25th to the Orange Peel in Asheville is Green Sky Bluegrass. The band blurs a line between a progressive bluegrass band and a jam band, which creates a show full of incredible musicianship and extended improvisations. Green Sky Bluegrass is not your grandpa's bluegrass band. For more information on this event, you can visit orangepeel.net. On Thursday, October 1st, Southern Rock icon's Leonard Skinner will be at the Smoky Stadium in Kodak, Tennessee, a band that's carried on through plane crashes and countless member changes. Johnny, the younger brother of the late Ronnie Van Zant, fronts the band and brings the spirit and passion of his late brother to the stage every night. As this year's outdoor concert season winds down, it will be one of your last chances to catch live music outside. Also, this may be your only chance to yell out Freebird at a concert and actually hear someone play it. I'm Tyler Rowlett for 91.3 WLMU and LMU Community TV, and that's your concert calendar for this week. We want to thank you for joining us for this weekend. We will see you again on Monday. For everyone behind the scenes, I'm Ashley Hartley.